our hearts up to you in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody said amen. 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 We've been on this series on the book of Daniel, and we're approaching it this way. If you've missed any of these weeks, I encourage you, go back on YouTube, go get our podcast and listen to it. It's been a strong series. We've just been going through the book of Daniel almost verse by verse and allowing Daniel to just speak to us, to preach to us, and to teach us some things. But we're approaching it from this, from this stance, from, from this kind of place of how do you live a godly life in an ungodly time? Like we're living in a, in a society, and I don't even think it's just this, this country. When you look at world news, you're actually seeing a shift all throughout the world in a major way that's just going further and further away from God. And not just shifting away from God, but actually turning and becoming oppositional toward God and even his values and his people. And I think one of the traps and one of the hard things for believers is we're constantly trying to stay relevant and we want to we don't want to be ostracized and you know we're trying but we want to hold on to our godly values. And let me just let me just tell you up front, there's gonna come a point. This is this is not it's not one of those messages that it's it's easy to share or it's easy to hear. I'm just gonna just, I'm just gonna warn you on that. Because it speaks this is gonna to speak to all of us, but there's gonna come a point where you're not gonna be relevant in, in the sense of fitting in. You'll be very relevant because you have the light of the world living on, on the inside of you. But you won't, we're peculiar people for a reason. That's what the Bible says. We just need to get used, used to it. We're a, little, we're a little different. We're a little different. They're, I don't, they're trying to help me out there. I appreciate it. And so but we, we got to just catch this and just understand, hey, at some point it's going to be harder and harder. There's opposition. But God gives us grace to live the life that he's called us to live. Can I get an amen on that? And so in the first week, we, we looked at Daniel chapter 1, and we saw that when culture shifts away from God, when you actually you enter into an oppositional culture that is opposite of God's values and God's ways, the first thing that happens is culture really does try to take your identity, tries to, tries to bring some confusion on your identity, and we, we talked through that in that first week. Really goes after that because if he can take your identity and take out who you are and how you were created and why you're on this earth, man, he can make all kinds of lies become true to you. And then the second week, last week, we talked about the greatest, really, I think the greatest battle that we're going to face in the last days. I think it's the battle that we're all facing right now, and it's who will you worship? It's really the battle over worship. You can almost call it uh, cultures or, or, or the, in the last days, the greatest test that we're, that we're ever going to, to have to make is, is who will we worship? We're all worshipers. The question is, who will you worship? And Satan's always trying. His goal is to always, at first, just try to, just try to cloud your worship. Like, let's just set some other things beside God so that he doesn't get everything that you have. Like, everything that he's supposed to, to receive, that he should receive as, as, as honor, as worship. But then if, you can't, if that doesn't work, and it's not just that, that's really not his end goal. The end goal really is to replace God and move him out of your life and out of society altogether and get you to just worship something other than God, including yourself. And so that's, it's, a, it's, the, it's a battle that we're going to have to face and that if you haven't, you will, and maybe you are right now. And I, just, I pray that God gives you strength. But go back and listen to that message because Daniel showed us and gave us some tools on how we can win that battle. And if last week was our, our greatest battle, I think... This week, we're going to see maybe the greatest trap that we could fall into. And I want to talk to us. This one hits all of us. I'm just, I'm just, again, I'm going to warn us. This is maybe a hard one to hear because it's going to hit, I think, every single one of us to some degree. And it's the greatest, I think it's the greatest trap in the last days. And, and, and really, it's, it's the reason that we see all the craziness and all the insanity that we have going on around. I'm just going to tell you what it is right off the bat. And we're going to talk about how, how do we identify it in our life? How does it come into our life? And then we're going to talk about how to get it out, like how to avoid this trap and get out of the trap. And it's the trap of pride. Oh, yeah, everybody said, mm, like nobody wants to hear that one, okay? And so, um, <laughs> man, it's a stronghold. Pride's a stronghold. And what's, what, so what we're going to read today is Nebuchadnezzar is speaking to us from Daniel chapter 4. It's actually him that's telling a story. And here's what's cool about the story. This is actually his conversion story. You know, at the end of, of his days, near the end of Nebuchadnezzar's days, he actually turned and began to worship and follow God. Nebuchadnezzar, the one that, that th- tried to throw, really, he did, he threw people in a fire because they wouldn't worship a golden image that he created, actually ended up turning and worshiping and following the God of Daniel. 
And he tells us exactly how. It's kind of his testimony, his conversion story of how did he get to the point of not creating and not having people worship an idol that's made out of, out of gold that represents him and, and turning and giving the glory to God. And so you want, you want to see what happens with him? You want, to, you want to see how he got there? Okay, so Daniel chapter 4, verse 1, and he starts off actually in the end. And so he, he, he kind of lets us know this is my conclusion, and then he tells us how, how he got there. And so we'll just start where he, where he started. And it's Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. This, this word prosper is um, it, it's, 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 it's similar where we almost, it's close to the word shalom. It's, it's actually shalim. And it really means that, like a peace in your soul. And so he's really saying, may your, may your soul be at great peace. So may you prosper greatly. And he says, in my pleasure, it's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I think, some, I think we just need to catch that part right there. Nebuchadnezzar, the one that was, that was probably the most arrogant and prideful one out of all of them, he comes to this conclusion and he, he, just, he, says, he says his kingdom is an eternal kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. In other words, it's not some archaic kingdom. It's not for the past. It's not for the good old days. It's not for, for when we, you know, there, there was no modern technology. But no, his dominion is actually set up and it reigns forever and ever. Can I get a big amen, somebody, on that? See, we, we, so we, we just need to understand that God still reigns. This is why I'm encouraged. Even when we see craziness happening in, in our world today, I'm encouraged because the reality is our God will always sit on the throne. And our God will always reign. And guess what? People will, at some point, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. My question is, will you do it now or will you do it later? But at some point, you're going to do it. And I suggest that you do it now when you have the choice, right? So Nebuchadnezzar, he's giving glory to God. But let me just tell you, it took some, some craziness, some insanity in his life to actually get into that part. And he actually tells us in this next verse how he got to this conclusion, like what happened in his life to actually bring him to this place of understanding that God is the true God, that God's the God that deserves praise. And if you're taking notes, I'm just going to share a few things with us of how, how, can we, how do we know some, that, that we have pride going on in our life? What are some signs? Almost what are the ingredients to pride coming into our life? And maybe just check ourselves as we go through. Just ask the Holy Spirit, would you search me? Would you check me and, and speak to me? Uh, this morning. So Daniel chapter 4, in the very next verse, he actually starts to give us clues of what was going on in his heart and in his world that brought him to a place of crazy pride and insane thinking. And he says this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 4, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. Contented and prosperous. Now, now there's nothing wrong with being content. In fact, Paul said, godliness with contentment is great gain. But I just want you to notice the contentment is mixed with godliness. So God being involved in it. Godliness with contentment is great gain, is what Paul said. But here he says, I was at home in my palace, and I was contented, and I was prosperous. There's, there's, there's a test that comes in our life, I think, when we begin to receive and experience some prosperity some fruitfulness. And I'm not talking about just financial prosperity. You know, I've been, I've been in ministry for over 20 years now, especially with my, my dad was a senior pastor for a season and been involved in church for a long time, but I've, I've been in full-time ministry for a good 20 years. And I've noticed a pattern with people. And I've noticed a pattern with people in church. It's kind of interesting. Life goes to hell and they come to church. Life gets restored and they leave church. Like they leave, they, they forget that God is the one that actually brought things back in order for him. And here's what, I think every generation, I think every person faces this question. Really, it's a test, I think, and it's when, when things start going good, when we start experiencing prosperity in our life, when fruitfulness begins to abound, when strongholds and addictions begin to fall off, when finances get in order, when our marriages get restored, when things with kids, all, all these things start to happen, will we remember God? Will, or will we forget about him? 
See, there's a danger that can come with, content, with, con, with being content and prosperous. In fact, most generations in, 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 throughout culture, throughout history, failed this test. They end up forgetting. In fact, in Judges, it even says, when I almost put this, I almost had us read it, but I'm just going to say it. In Judges, it says that when, when Joshua, after Joshua uh, got all the children of Israel over into the promised land and they defeated and conquered the whole promised land, it says that when Joshua died and all the elders that outlived him died, that there was a generation that rose up that didn't know God. They didn't fault. Why? There was some prosperity and they got contented and they forgot about him. In fact, in Deuteronomy 8, before they ever even got into the promised land, God warns them and says, when you get in that land and you eat the bread of that land and you eat the fruit of that land, make sure you give praise to God. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to eat it and you're going you're gonna to drink the wine of that land. And you're going to eat the bread of that land and the fruit of that land. And guess what? You're going to forget about them and you're going to get fat and lazy and you're going to sin against me. And then when that happens, you're going to see your life go right back into calamity. And that's what he doesn't want to have happen. See, con- what, what, what happens when we fall into this contentment and, and, this, and prosperity sometimes is it, it can lead to, it doesn't always, but it can lead to, if we're not careful, it can lead to complacency, which is, which is really kind of like, a, I, I'm good, I don't, I don't need to keep growing. I don't, no, I got, what, I got what I needed. I don't need to be free in that area anymore. No, 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 I don't, I don't, need, no, I don't need to be stretched. I don't need to do more. I don't, wanna, I don't need to lean in more. But this, you ready to get your toe stepped on a little bit? I don't need to be in part of a life group. I go to church on Sundays. I don't need to be in a life group. I know the Bible says that gather all the more when you see the day approaching, but I don't need it. I know the model that he gave us in Acts chapter 2 was to constantly be gathering. I, I know Ephesians says that every joint is supply. I know that Romans says that we should all use the graces and talents that we have for ministry. But I'm good. I'm good because, you know, I, I got what I needed. And let me just tell you, that stunts you. A complacent level of complacency begins to get there. And then here's the other thing that can end up happening is this entitlement mentality starts to fall into our lives where we just kind of have this mentality. And and I see this, and I I love all all of our older people. I say this, and if this is you, this don't, no, no, really, I I say this with honor. But I'm just telling you, as a young man, I'm looking to older for some guidance. I'm just, I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm looking to those that have more gray hair than me. I'm looking to those, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm looking to those that have raised their children. I'm looking to those that have run the, the leg of race that I'm on. And, and when I look and I survey the, the landscape, unfortunately, I see many that have said, I've already done my thing. I don't need to do anything else. And what I end up seeing with, with many people that, that, in my age too, people that have been very successful, they just, they don't have anything else that they do. They just kind of live in this little life like this is all that there was for them. They don't ever actually grow, and so they have this entitlement that I can just do whatever I want right now. I, I'll tell you that I think that is one of the traps of, uh, of, re- of retirement. There's nothing wrong with retiring, but are you retiring from life and living for God? Or are, you, or are you just retiring from having to do that job that you hated? There's a difference. I told you this is, a, this is one that's not going to be necessarily fun to, to hear, but it's something I think that we all need to hear, something that we all need, including myself. It's really easy to say, well, I, once I reach this level of success or this level of freedom or this level of peace or this level of whatever, I can just kind of sit back and recline and just let things come my way and just kind of do whatever. Summertime comes, I, I, I endured the winter <laughs> and fall, I mean spring. Let me just every week, let me just go out to the beach, let me just hit the, there's nothing wrong with that, but here, here's, here's the danger. We start to put God down and put ourselves in here. Here's, here's what ended up happening with King Nebuchadnezzar. And it's this, it's, it's we become self-sufficient instead of becoming God-dependent. So, so in other words, in our life, we start to walk in a, self, a level of self-sufficiency instead of God-dependency. Like, I'm good. I'm good. And that's what was going on with Nebuchadnezzar. He was walking in his palace, and he was contented and prosperous, and he was just like, oh, man, look at this. This is awesome. I just feel good. Like, I'm probably the best king that Babylon has ever had. I don't need to do anything else. I mean, to, think about it to the point where he's building golden images 
of himself and trying to force people to worship him. He's just, I can do what I want. I can make people do what I want. I can have whatever I have. I'm good. Let me just tell you, there's a danger in there. There's a trap in there. That, that's called insane thinking. Just want to let you know, that's crazy thinking. And I think if we look in the world right now, we look at our country right now, you know, the greatest nation, I think, to ever grace this planet, that God has blessed our nation. I don't care what you think politically, God has blessed our nation. We used to be the most sending and most giving nation in the world when it came to missionaries. We're no longer that. We used to give the most, send the most missionaries. We were the gospel spreading nation of the world. I think God blessed us for that. But we got, I think we got content and prosperous and some crazy thinking started coming in, which led, I think, and has led, and I think even to the church with some complacency and entitlement, even how we treat people. You know, I, I won't, I, I'll say it. You know, Sunday, Sunday afternoons is when waitresses and waiters hate to work at restaurants because a bunch of people get out of church and they feel entitled to the best service instead of being the server, instead of coming in to be a blessing to people, not realizing that it's the, it's the Sunday rush of lunch and this waiter or waitress is not making a ton of money and their whole role is about hospitality, making you feel good, and they're living off of our tips. And we come in there and we're rude. Let's not be that kind of people. Okay, that's not my message. All right. So, 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 so Daniel continues, or really Nebuchadnezzar continues to share what's going on in his life and in his world. And, and, uh, and, and so I'm going to skip a few verses. You can read it. But basically, here's what happens. The very next verse, he says, and I was freaked out because I had this dream. I had a nightmare. And here's what he saw in this dream. He saw, he saw in the next verse, he saw this dream of a, of a tree. This big, large tree, and in this dream, this, this, this dream, it was fruitful. The leaves were green. It was flourishing. Like it was, it was a, it was a good tree. The Bible says that that, or he, he said that in this dream, he saw animals running to it and birds finding shelter in it and people underneath it. And then he heard this voice, and it said, "This tree is about to get cut down. And there's going to be a stump that's left, left with with iron and, and silver and all, bronze and stuff that's just kind of holding it down." And so he got freaked out, and so he called in all of his magicians and astrologers, and he asked them to share with him, like, what's the interpretation of this? This dream and nobody could share it with him. No one knew what it was. And then walked in Daniel. If you read Daniel chapter 2, you would know that Daniel's able to interpret dreams. God gave him the ability to interpret dreams. And so Daniel comes walking in and he, he asks Daniel, he goes, let me tell you this dream and I need your help. And so I want us to look at verse 20 of what happens here. Daniel chapter 4 verse 20, it says, the tree you saw. So, so, so Daniel's about to give him the interpretation and Nebuchadnezzar's hoping that this dream was about his enemies. But Daniel's about to share something different with them. He said, The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds, your majesty, you are that tree. Now that could have had his head chopped off right there. But he was bold enough to say, it's act, this, this dream's actually about you. Nebuchadnezzar was hoping it was about his enemies, but it's actually about you. He says, you become great and you become strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let them be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let them live with the wild animals until seven years, seven times have passed by. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with wild animals. You're going to eat grass like ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven years will pass by you, and we're going to see this, the second element, the second crazy thinking, the, the, an element, something that happens in our life when pride enters in, when that stronghold begins to come into our life, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Here, here was his issue. Nebuchadnezzar was taking credit when he should have been giving God thanks. And that's, that's one of the things that happens to us is, is we start taking the credit instead of giving it to God, instead of giving thanks to God. We, we start to think that, well, it's, it was, it's because I worked so hard. No one else was working those late nights. No one else was, 
No one else was studying the Bible as much as I was. I was quoting scripture. I was at every service and I was praying. Like we can, we can do that in the church and spirit world, but we can also do that with our kids. Man, I invest in my kids and I do this and we go to counseling and we read all these books or, or man, I went to school and I have all these degrees and just all these different things that start to rise up and we start to say, well, it's because of me. It's because of me that I did it. And, and actually it, it, it's not. God gave you that ability. He's the one that gave you the ability. He gave you that mind. He gave you that drive. He gave you those physical and those mental attributes. He gave you the capacity to do all that. That was God. He's the one that gave it to you. And so we start, we start taking the credit and stop giving God thanks. And so when we stop giving thanks and praise to God, we stop remembering that he's the source of our success. This is, this is why when, when, we, when, when we get up, I'm not, try, I'm not trying to give an emotional, and make, make an emotional response, like stir people up emotionally and manipulate people when we get up here and we say, come on, let's give God praise. Let's give him better praise. When I'm telling you, come on, let's clap our hands. Let's give praise. Let's sing a song to God. Let's give him thanks. It's not so that I can just kind of, you know, a hype show. No, no, no. I'm trying to, trying to help us do what we ought to do. You know, your flesh, our flesh naturally does not want to give praise to God. In fact, Galatians says that our flesh and our spirit are at odds with one another. There's a constant war. Let me just say, your spirit wants to give praise to God, wants to worship God, wants to yield its life to God, but your flesh does not. And sometimes we don't give praise and give thanks to God because we just don't feel like it. Like, we know that we should, but because we don't feel it, I think this is one of the things that happen. Because we don't feel it, we don't do it. And I think one of the reasons is partly because some of us, we feel like, well, it's disingenuine then. But praise has nothing to do with you. Praise is not about you. Praise is about the object of your praise. Giving thanks is about giving thanks to the object of the, th- like, who has blessed you? Who has given you life? Who has restored you? Who has renewed you? Who has saved you? Who has paid the price for all of your sins? You know, some, sometimes in worship, I bend my knee, like I, I get to the ground low, when I, especially when I don't feel like it. Because I have to tell my flesh, you're not in control. You're not in charge. No, there's God. And my life is yielded to him. And so I like to just get on my knees and get as low as I can. I like to get in my basement. And when the floor is dirty, even when it's dirty, I'd rather vacuum it. Sometimes I'll vacuum it. Okay. But even when the floor is dirty and I'm like, I don't want to get down there. No, I'm going to. I need to, I need to just get low before God. And I, I need to just walk around my home. I just need to, need to drive around and say, God, you gave me that. And God, you blessed me with this. And God, you gave me that wife. I didn't deserve it. You gave it to me. God, you gave me these awesome kids. God, you gave me this church. God, you let me lead. You let me do this. You're the one that lets, you give me the strength. You give me, do you see what I'm saying? But Nebuchadnezzar was, was taking credit for himself. And he was, he was acting like, like he did it. But, but that's not what we're called to do. In fact, God always wants us to give thanks. In 1 Thessalonians Paul is speaking in verse five, or chapter 5, verse 16. He says, rejoice always <laughs> in the wintertime. <laughs> Come on, Jordan. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm preaching to myself, y'all. <laughs> if you weren't here, I've been preaching this to myself all week. Okay, rejoice always when the sun is not out, when the weather is not favorable. To me, like rejoice always. Okay, rejoice always. Pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Listen, when things are going good and when things are going bad, when things are going great, thank you, God. I give you praise. Thank you for doing this for me. Thank you for breaking through for me. Thank you for giving me the wisdom in that idea. Thank you, God, for tearing down those walls. Thank you, God, for that promotion. Thank you. Thank you for the rest. Thank you for the healing in my body. When things are going bad, God, thank you that you're working this thing out for my good. God, I thank you that you don't waste any bad thing on my life. God, I thank you that a, a testimony is being born right now. Thank you, God, that you're causing my strength to come up. God, I thank you that you're always faithful and you're faithful to deliver me out. Do you see what I'm talking about here? Give thanks in all things, in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. I like what Paul said to, to the Corinthian church in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 4. He said, he said, what are you so puffed up about? And what do you have that God hasn't given you? See, sometimes we just, we just need to be reminded, whatever I do have 
It's all from God anyway. So he says, what are you puffed up about? Like, why are you thinking that you're big shot? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why act as though you're so great and as though you've accomplished something on your own? Listen, as a church, we're praying, we we're praying even yesterday, on, yesterday morning at prayer, and, and I was just telling God, but we were praying, God, keep us humble. Because when, when God uses us, let me, let me just have a little bit of family business like for us as a church. We will never be afraid or back down from the Lord blessing our church. We're praying that God adds to our church. I'm just letting you know. We, we are. We're praying that God brings in new people and they get saved and they get healed and they get freed and then they get equipped for the work of their ministry and they launch out and do everything that God has called them to do. That's, that's what our prayer is. We're praying that we're a big old distribution factory. I was visiting my parents uh, uh, this, over this past week and we drove by where the Silver Dome used to be. They live on the east side of the state. So we drove by where the Silver Dome used to be and you know what's there now? Big old Amazon hub. It's huge. And I just thought to myself when I saw that, may that be our church. Not the Amazon building, but maybe we'd be like a, a big old distribution hub where all of God's gifts and his blessings and his favor just flows through this place and goes out to wherever it's needed, wherever it's ordered. But guess what? You need God's blessing to come in for that. But as he does it, we're not going to be puffed up. We're not going to be an arrogant people. A prideful people thinking like, well, we just have our systems in order and, you know, we, we know how to, <laughs> trust me, y'all, y'all know me enough. I ain't got n- hardly anything in order. The only thing I got in order is Jesus. <laughs> like, and, and, and it's not even me that has him in order. He's got me in order, right? <laughs> like, he's, working on, he's working on me, <laughs> trying to help me. And that's how we need to act. That's how we need to operate as the Lord blesses our life and takes care of us. And as he blesses our church and causes us to be able to do more and more and influence the city, we need to constantly stay humble and not be puffed up. Just say, God, it's you, God. You're the one that's doing it all for us. When he blesses your family, listen, when he pays off your mortgage, when he gets you in that house that you've been believing, when he gives you that spouse that you've been believing for, listen, when he does the miraculous in your life, you better not say, well, it's because I work so hard. You better say, it's because God's grace came on me and he operated through me. So the next verse, verse 26, I'm going to go into point number three. Here's the third thing. He says, the command, verse 26, he says, the command to leave the stump. So, so he, gives, he, gives, he gives them what the, the, the interpretation of the dream. And, but, but here's the thing I love about God is he, he gives warning. He gives correction. Gives, I mean, he, he, he's a good God, so he corrects. He doesn't want us to go to hell. He doesn't want our lives to lead to destruction. But I love this. He always leaves a stump. In other words, he always leads, leaves a a way up, a way of restoration. He doesn't just uproot us and tear us all the way down. He leaves a little something for us to hang on to. And this is, this is the word to Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe for some of us, we might be sitting here saying, I'm, I'm like Nebuchadnezzar. May not have gone crazy, may not be having this exact dream, but I got some stuff going on in me. I can see some of these insane thoughts in me right now. And here's, here's what the Lord would say and says to him. Verse 26, he says, The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you. But here's, here's when it's going to happen. This is point three. When you acknowledge that, everybody say those last two words with me, heaven rules. We need to acknowledge that it's God that's in control. It's God that rules. And here's, here's, the, here's the third kind of insane thoughts that come into our head, ways that we start to live that brings really calamity and insanity and just craziness in our lives. And it's this, that thinking that we rule instead of acknowledging that heaven rules. Like we think that we are in control. We think that we don't need a Lord. We think that we are our own Lord. We think that we're our own creator. We think that God's ways are, are just not as good as our ways. Right? We, start to, we start to elevate ourselves, and we begin, we begin to lower God. And, and with the mindset, and you see this out in the world, you see it happening in the world, that my ways are better than God's ways. Like, like when God had the Bible written, like when he gave his, he gave, gave his word and he inspired it, he didn't know that we were going to be living in such a progressive society that we're living in now. He didn't know about the technology and, and all of a sudden these amazing ideas that just popped into our head that no one has ever thought about. For, for all these years, we've known what 
what two plus two is? I mean, let me just, I, I, I watched a thing this last week that someone literally was on the news saying, well, two plus two might not equal four. I mean, just very ser- two plus two might not equal four. It might equal five, depending on who you are. That's insane thinking. No, I'm, I'm just letting you know that's crazy thinking. And I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not bagging on the person. But I'm, what I'm telling you is that pride has entered in and it starts to make you think, no, I, what truth is, that's not truth anymore. No, 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 no. I have a different thought. And that, this is what that thought is. This, is. this is actually the way. My way is better. I know God wants me to stay married. But I like her instead. I, I, I know, that, I know that, that, that God wants me to stay married. I know the Bible says that what God has joined together, let no man separate. I know that, God, that the Bible says God hates divorce. I know that. But he gives grace. My ways are better. He, he just wants me to be happy. Let me just tell you, God is a just God. He's a true God. He's a true God. He's a just God. We have, we have these thoughts. We start to elevate ourselves in our own ways. So we've got to be crazy. We've got to be careful not to, not to start participating and receiving some of these crazy thoughts and insane thinking that starts to come our way. So what do we do? Daniel, Daniel steps in and, he, and he, he starts speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and he, and he doesn't just give the interpretation. He starts to give some advice. And I think it's godly advice. And I think it's advice for us today. If we'll receive it. And I just want to say, just take the advice. In the next verse, Daniel says, Therefore, your majesty, he takes a risk. Because not everybody wants to hear this stuff. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right. And your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. It may be that, that there's a warning being given to you right now, and if you will heed the warning and take the warning and you stop acting and thinking and doing what you're doing and you shift and you repent and you start doing what's right, what, that dream will only be a warning. It won't be a pronouncement. And, and I believe there's warnings that are coming on the world and coming on our country, coming on people, coming on businesses, coming, coming on fam. I think there's warnings coming and have been coming. But the question is, will you take the advice? And will you allow it to be a warning that causes you to shift and renounce your sins and repent so that you, you can continue in the prosperity that you've, been, that you've been experiencing? Or will you act like so many do, sadly, which is you go to church where you spend time with God, you have, your, you have your time with the Lord reading your Bible, and he speaks to you, and it's something that you don't like, and you go, that's a good word, but, and you don't do anything about it. You don't make any shifts. Why? Because I don't think that's going to really happen. I, I think partly because you're still deceived into thinking that my ways are better than God's ways. You're still deceived into thinking that the reason that you are where you are is because of yourself and not because of God. I think you're still deceived because you haven't been giving thanks and praise to God that, that it, you, you can just have and do whatever you want with no consequences. And I think if we looked, if we were honest, and we, just, we, we took off political, um, political bl- blinds off of our eyes, the scales, the lenses of politics, and, and we really we looked from a biblical perspective, I think we would see on all sides... That there's a lot of warning going on, but there's also a lot of craziness going on. And there's some things that are happening, and, and we're, we're, we're headed to a place almost of close to no return. But I truly believe that if, if we would heed in our lives and in our country, in our city, I, I really believe it, that if we would heed the warning of the Lord and resist pride and, and really get out of this trap, humble ourselves, that we'll actually see some turnaround. We'll actually see some turnaround. He always gives warning. He always gives direction to get out and to avoid the traps. The question is really, will, will, we, will we receive it? And how do you do it? Well, I, the, the Bible actually, God, God actually gave us a really clear way. Second Chronicles, and it's quoted all the time, but the question is, do we do it? Do we do it? 
Like, I, I, know, I know we got stuff going on on Saturdays, but do we come to prayer on Saturday morning? Do we actually do what the Bible says to do? Second Chronicles 7.14. We could all quote it probably. If. You just stop right there. It's conditional. If. Everybody say it with me. If. All right. If my people who are called by my name will say these two words with me, humble themselves. My people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Amen. That's the roadmap. That's the, that you want to know how to avoid those first three points? Those first three points are answered right here. But here's what happens with Nebuchadnezzar. I think this happens with a bunch of us. <laughs> it's scary. Verse 28 says, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar, but didn't happen right away. It didn't happen right away. And I think that's part of the trap, is God gives warnings, and we know that God's speaking to us about something, but we don't change it immediately. And so we think because we didn't see something happen that day or two days later, uh, it was all a dream, right? Like we just, it was just that guy preaching, he's crazy. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to just tell us these kind of things so that we feel bad and repent and do all these other things. That's just what they're, that's like their job. It's, it's not. My, my job is to actually just preach the Bible to you. And whatever it says, we do. I'm supposed to help us with that. The good and the hard the, and the easy. And, and, and even this last week, as I was praying and preparing, I felt like I, I was just supposed to say this, this one thing to all of us. And I say it with all love. All love. And, and, and it was this. Be warned. Be warned. Pride will lead to insanity. Be warned. Be warned. Pride will lead to insanity. You know what insanity is? Insanity is not just like deranged in the mind. It's, it's turmoil in your soul. It's the opposite of the prosperity that King Nebuchadnezzar was talking about. It's the, it's the opposite of shalom. You no longer have the peace in your soul. Now you're ter- you have turmoil. You're all distraught and messed up in your soul. You kind of don't even know which way is up and which way is right and which way is left. You're just all messed up. And that's actually where so many people are right now. That's why, that's why there's so much insanity because, because they, 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 got, they, got, they got that pride in them and it just leads to this turmoil, this insanity that's in their soul. And that's what God is trying to keep us. Are you, are you tracking with me this morning? Yeah. And so it says this, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I've built as the royal residence? Check this out. By my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty, is this not the life that I've created for myself? Look what we can do now. Is, is it, I've worked hard. Do you, are you, do, you, do, you see any, do you see any eerie similarities to today that we're living in? He said, is this not the great? He says all this stuff, verse 31. He says, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You're already removed. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by. Seven years will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. Immediately, what had been said, 12 months had passed, but when the decree came, immediately it happened to him. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. It happened. Even though he didn't see it right away, it did happen, and it happened instantly. 
And that's what happens to so many people. And I pray that for us it doesn't happen. I pray that we heed the warning and we see the trap and we avoid the traps. And let me just tell you, it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank or what your job title is at, at work or any of that. Pride hits everybody. Insane thoughts hit everybody. This stuff, this is for everybody. But there's hope. And this is what, this is, this is what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. The next verse, he says, At the end of, t- of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I raised my eyes toward heaven. In other words, I, I, I looked, I acknowledged God. I acknowledged him, I'd raised my eyes, and my sanity was restored. It was brought back into my right thinking. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. I I love this. Listen, he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Like, what's wrong with you? What are you thinking? No one can say that. He's God. At the same time that my sanity was restored, check this out, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne, check this out, and became even greater than before. When? When I acknowledged God. When I left the pride, when that came off of me. If you don't want any feathers you don't want the dew falling on you all day long. You don't want to be driven away from people. Heed this. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because, oh, this, we got to catch this church, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. If you, want, if you want God to exalt you, if you, got, if you want God to lift you up, if you want his favor on your life, anybody want that? Yeah. Here, here's what you do. The, 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 God tells us exactly the kind of people he's looking for. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, he says, These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit. In other words, they're repentant. And who tremble at my word. Like when my, when, they, when my word comes, they actually take me seriously. Those are the ones that I, I like to give favor to. Those are the ones I like to lift up. So I just want to give you three quick things. I'm going to get you out of here. It's not going to be another message. Don't you worry. But how, how to combat this pride, how to overcome it. Like how do we humble ourselves? And the first thing is exalt God. Just, just exalt him. Like, just, just give him praise. Like, give, give praise to him because he deserves it. In fact, can we just take, like, 10 seconds, and let's just give praise to God right now. God, you're great, and you're awesome. God, you're worthy of all praise. You are the great I am. You're the ones that set the, the stars in the heavens. You're the one that gives life to us and causes our heart to breathe. Praise you, Jesus. Yeah, see, see we, we've got to get there. We've got to just exalt God. We come in church, let me tell you, we talked about this last week, we come in church and we act like, like something's wrong with you if you give praise. Like if we lay, lay, raise our hands and we get, begin to shout. Let me just tell you, this is God Almighty. <laughs> I, I watch, I, watch uh, I talked about it last week, I watched the gram, I'm on it. And I, 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 it cracks me up when I see, um, it doesn't matter who's in office, but I see a president walk into a business or into an area and people might not even agree with them, might not even like them, might talk trash to them. But when he gets in their presence, see, they might say something from a, from a distance, but when they see that secret service open up the door and they see him start walking in, you know, you know what's funny? They all are like, oh, hi. And they're smiling and taking selfies. And they're like, oh, and, and, and here's what's real funny. They go, man, I just think you're doing such a great job. Like, that's how so many of them do, even if they like them or they don't like them. You know what I'm talking about? See, because when greatness, when power, when authority walks in the room, you, you, you're in awe of it. 
well, that's the most powerful man on earth. Whoa, like he's for real. When God walks in the room and you encounter his greatness, you will fall to the ground. So many people are, when I see God, I'm just going to tell you, no, you won't. <laughs> let me just, uh, let me just, yeah, <laughs> you better relax your mind, friend. <laughs> let me help you out. With, uh, <laughs> you will not, you won't even be able to look at him. <laughs> Here's the second thing. Acknowledge that God does everything right and all his ways are just. This doesn't mean that you have to understand everything. But you need to acknowledge. You need to acknowledge that everything he does is right. And all of his ways are just. There are times that I read the Bible. Just be, be, be very, I was reading the Bible, I was reading this morning. And I stopped, and this happens to me on a regular basis, where I just stop and I say, why? why? God, why, why did it have to be like that? Let me, just, let me just show you the difference. In posture, though, I'm not saying, what are you thinking What's wrong with you? I'm trying to understand him and his ways. Some, there's, there's parts of the Bible, there are ways of God that I just do not get. There are things that I wish were written in the Bible very clear and just say, this is not right. Do, and I'm like, you don't, you don't do that. I've had conversations with my wife and I've said, I'll tell you what, there's one thing I struggle with, being a follower of God, and I don't understand why this, like, why is this, why, why is it like this? Why doesn't the Bible just, and, huh, we've we just had those conversations. But my job is not to get everything to a place where I understand and where it makes sense to me now. My job is to get under his authority and say, you are God, all of your ways are right, and all of your ways are just. Please give me understanding and show me how to live. And some things I just don't, my kids don't understand the why for everything. And they will call me a big old meanie. <laughs> but they don't understand that there's a semi truck right there. And I don't have time to explain it to them. Get your butt out the street right now. Get, get off the grass. Get off the grass. Why? Because there's a beehive right there. You don't see it. I don't want you to get all jacked. Are you, you hear what I'm saying? But we, but we won't follow the instructions of God and acknowledge it because we don't understand it. Okay, here's the third thing. Walk humbly before God. Just walk in humility. And I think this, this, is, this is the hardest one. Like, what do you mean? I, if, I, if, I, if I do that, then, then, I, then I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to have low self-esteem. I'm, not, I'm supposed to, I am somebody. I remember when I was a kid growing up in Detroit, we had this we had the speech, we did the Pledge of Allegiance, and then the very next thing was we had this other speech that it was an I am somebody speech. And we just had, we had to declare it and speak it over ourselves. I am somebody, and I am strong, and I'm important, I will do great things, I'm not going to stay in the hood all my life, right? It was like all these different things that we had to declare and speak over ourselves. And so we start to think like, no, no, no I'm not supposed to humble myself, but let me just tell you, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. And so we're all going to get humbled at some point. It's just a matter of when and how. You get to choose the way. And I believe for the, the Lord is letting us decide, how will you humble yourself? Will you choose it or will it be forced upon you? See, because when it's forced upon you, that's called humiliation. And that's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to have humiliation. He wants to lift you up. In fact, James 4 verse 10, and I'm going to close with this, says, humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up. Let's do that right now. Let's just, in fact, let's all just stand up right now. And as we stand, we humble our hearts. Just speak to the Lord for a moment. Just, just search your own heart and ask God, is there any pride in me? Is there any insane thinking in me? Do I need to shift? Anything I need to repent of? Like the, the Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. We humble ourselves before you today, God. 
and we acknowledge you are God and we are your people. We were created for your good pleasure, not the other way around. You are great and greatly to be praised. And every good and perfect thing that we have in our lives has all come from you. We may have worked hard, may have had success, but it came from you. You gave us the ability. You put us in that family. You gave us that mind, those connections, that personality, the gifts. It all comes from you, God. So Lord, please forgive us of any pride, any haughtiness, any arrogance that we've been operating in, individually, corporately. Today we repent. If you need to, just tell us, God, I repent of my pride. Repent, Lord, and I ask that you, my, my sense within all this, that you, you want us to be like Jesus who delighted in the fear of the Lord. For us to be a people that delight in the fear of the Lord. In reverence and in awe of knowing who you are and who you are in relation to us. And we thank you that the reason that we are seated in high places, the reason that we are in Christ is only because of your grace. Any kind of blessing and favor and breakthrough that we have, any ability that we have is to have overflow in our life, any freedom that we have, God, it's all because of you. And Lord, we pray for our world, that you would bring humility to the world, but Lord, that you would help us to not have to be humbled, but help us to humble ourselves. When we go out of this place, God, help us to be people that it's not that we think less of ourselves, but that we just think of ourselves less. But that we prefer others and that we give you the glory when someone compliments us. We say thank you, but we give you the glory. We don't let it get to our heads. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, speak to anybody this morning. I know he spoke to me, man. I've already preached this message to myself a few times. I'm like still getting dinged up on some stuff. <laughs> so listen to it some more so you can catch up. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Anyway, uh, hey, God's doing some great things in our church. And he's going to do some great things in you and in your life and your marriage. Listen, in your, in your school, I see students up in here. And he's going to do some awesome things for you. He wants to give you favor. But as he does, remember that it's God that's giving you the favor. Amen. Well, enjoy this nice... Thank you, Lord, for rejoicing, God, in, in no sun right now, in the clouds, because the clouds mean that it brings rain, and rain means that flowers will come, and flowers mean that the sun will shine again. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for being with us. I know I'm kind of messing around because we're done, but we got another service that's going to be getting in here pretty soon here. So thanks so much for being with us. We love you. Have an awesome week. Go